I don't know if you've been paying attention to the soccer players uh, that were uh, trapped in the cave. Have you been paying attention to the news? Uh, very tragic situation. Uh, I, you know, caves are scary things anyway. Uh, I've been in them many times. Uh, and these young guys hiked in. Uh, they were in some two, two and a half miles inside the cave, which is a long ways to go into a cave. Uh, and the, the unthinkable happened. Uh, early rains came, flooded the cave out. Uh, and uh, left them trapped in the darkness with the rising floodwaters, no way to get out. Uh, Twelve boys and their coach, soccer team. Uh, there was uh, one, the military, you know, assembled uh, in Thailand to get the, get the boys out. Uh, it was a desperate situation. Uh, time was of the essence. They had food, no water, etc. cetera. Um, and so they, uh, they began to formulate teams to, to save them. Uh, there was one man uh, who paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, initially uh, to bring them oxygen. Uh, he was a, a former Navy SEAL diver for the uh, Thailand, Thailand and he's mission, uh, the mission uh, for the military. Uh, his name was uh, Saman Kunan. You can see his picture here. Uh, he uh, put on the, the proper gear, uh, and went swimming to take those boys uh, their first oxygen tanks so they could have the opportunity to get out of there. Uh, on his way back through the darkness, you can imagine swimming in a cave in, in the darkness, uh, in that murky water, uh, feeling your way through tight places with oxygen tanks. Uh, the bravery is unbelievable. On his way back, he ran out of oxygen himself uh, and died. He's now a hero uh, in the military and for these boys. Uh, and the, they are extolling his name for what he has done for them. Uh, he laid his da- life down so they could find deliverance. Um, here's a picture of a schematic a cutaway of the, of the cave. I don't know if you got down to that detail. This kind of shows you where they were in the cave system. Um, but if you went into the cave entrance, you can see there was a, like the U-shaped joint, where it was, which was full of water, kind of like the, the trap underneath your sink. Uh, there's always like water in there. And then the cave had that kind of structure. So once that was flooded out, the, the, number one, it was a very tight space to get through anyway, uh, and then it's full of water. And then the boys are, you know, farther down into the cave than that. So there's no way they could get through either of those uh, watery locations too far to, too far to swim, um, a deadly situation. But they found deliverance through the sacrifice of one man. I don't know about you, but that has a theological motif written all over it, does it not? I mean, it truly does. Uh, it helps us understand the stories about us, help us th- like that in the news, help us remember uh, the work of another man on a, in another place. Uh, his name was Christ. Uh, and to take this particular motif uh, that you find here from the news and apply it to our lives, theologically speaking, notice, knowing that what happened there, when you take that metaphor and you apply it to the book of Romans, it's exactly what Paul's talking about in the book of Romans. Uh, like in what way? Well, uh, we are born trapped in a cave called sin. And there's no way we can get out of this cave called sin. We can't work our way out. We can't swim our way out. Uh, we can't morally uh, be fantastic to get our way out. You're hopelessly lost in that cave of sin. Uh, you need deliverance, Paul says in this book. Uh, and the deliverance based on that analogy is uh, a diver, another diver. But it's a divine diver. This diver's name is Christ. And he leaves the glory of heaven. And he goes swimming down to the darkness of your sin to come, to come give you the option to be redeemed. He just goes to a cross. Uh, and lays his life down for your sin and your darkness. And then he dies. But then as Paul teaches us in the book of Romans, all those lost in that cave of sin that want to be freed, there's only one way out. And that's through the work of Christ, not your work. Uh, that story preaches all day long, that cave story, because you understand the danger of that situation, especially if you're claustrophobic. Could you imagine? Uh, when I was in Arizona as a young youth pastor, there was a lady who cut my hair, uh, and I was, I think I was 27 at the time, and she was probably in her 20s too, and one day I asked her, because there's a lot of caves around the Tucson area, a lot of spelunking going on there, and, um, and I asked her one day, like, what did you do last week? And she said, I went into a cave with the friends, and we encountered a big giant pool of water, uh, and as we waded into the water, which is, I wouldn't have done that to start off with, uh, but she said, we waded into the water, and they said, as we got over to the side of the cave wall, if you dive down here on one breath, you can swim through this tube. Uh, yeah, right. And then you'll pop up in this beautiful cavern. Uh-huh, yeah, right. Yeah, if you ever want to know God's will for your life, it's not to do that. So, so, I, so, I, so I said, okay, well, like, what happened? She said, well, you know, they all took a breath, and they went under, and I never saw them again. Okay, great. I would have just walked out of the cave. It's over. Uh, so I said, what'd you do? She said, uh, well, I took a breath and I went into that hole. You have got to be kidding me. I mean, that is insane. 
You know, I mean, you think about Jesus. I mean, he did more than that for you, did he not? I mean, he left the glory of heaven, didn't have to, because he loved you. He saw you were in a cave of sin. You can't get out. Uh, and he went into that dark, restrictive place, your sin, to defeat it. That's unbelievable. See, that's what Paul's talking about. So we want to look at a, a, this message today of how does the sinner who's born in a cave of sin get out of it? How do you get out? Uh, we want to look at uh, Paul's methodology here. We looked last week at the wrong way out. Uh, and we touched upon the first principle of the right way out, but, but there's four components to the right way out, as we're going to see. Um, so we want to go back to God's escape plan for sinners. And we want to review, because review, as I've said many times before, is a wonderful thing as you get older and brain cells die. I'm just saying, right. When you go to the Kennedy Center, you're trying to find your car, how do you find it? Do you just aimlessly walk around? Or do you, what I do anymore is I take a picture of my car. <laughs> I take a picture of the pillar, A35, spot number 207 or whatever. So that when I come out of there, knowing I could probably completely forgot where I parked, I can go right to my car and look cool to my wife. It's like, hey, found the car, babe. It's right there, you know. <laughs> so since I know that uh, we tend to forget things, we want to review the first point that we talked about last week because it's been seven long days, right? So what was the, God's first escape plan premise? Uh, number one, uh, it is uh, the right path out of the cave of sin. Uh, he says, by way of review, uh, it's all about faith. Faith is the way out. I mean, I mean, and you think about it based on the motif. The boys had to put the tanks on, right? They're not swimmers. They're not scuba divers. And they had to go with this, this Navy diver out of there with the mask and believe he's going to guide us through the darkness and it's going to be okay. It's all about faith. I mean, think about that. Uh, Paul says, if you want to get out of the cave of sin, number one, it's all about faith. There's four components. Number one, verse 24, it's all about faith. Notice we're just reviewing. This is an introduction. What does he say? Being justified as a gift by his grace. That's all, that will stop right there. That's what we talked about last week, but we want to review it, right? Um, so if this is brand, you were here last week and this seems like brand new information to you, I don't know what to say. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, being justified, uh, is a grammatical thing that we need to stop and pause on because it's so important, being justified. I know, I know you love participles, I do. I'm passionate about them because how they're classified in Greek language. They, they spoke Greek, they wrote in Greek, they also, you know, Aramaic, etc. But the New Testament is written in Greek, so it matters like what verbiage he picks here. So when Paul says the first way out of the cave of sin is uh, you gotta be in this state of being justified. Uh, it is a present tense participle denoting perpetual activity. Okay, so what's that mean? That means once you're justified, it's a perpetual state. You don't get justified by God's means of faith and then get unjustified. And by the way, how many sins would it take for you to get unjustified if it was based on that premise? One, just uno, eins, one, just one. Paul says, no, no, uh, to, in, to get declared righteous in God's uh, courtroom, you have to be in a state of perpetual justification. Now bear in mind, I know I just did something in speaking terms you're not supposed to do. Do, do you realize what I did? I, I mixed metaphors. Okay, you remember? Okay, so what was the opening metaphor? Cave. cave. You're lost in a cave of sin. I've just now gone to the courtroom, all right? You follow this mixing metaphors. So when I was at Dallas Seminary taking preaching classes back in the 80s, uh, this, they told you never do this, but the professors aren't here. <laughs> so I can totally do this. So just bear in mind, park the cave motif for just a minute and tap into the courtroom. How does someone who's guilty before God's holy throne find the acquittal where they're declared righteous? That's justification. Uh, well, he uses this participle, being justified. It's a perpetual thing. Uh, and then what's most interesting about the participle, still reviewing from last week, but this is extra stuff I didn't talk about last week, in case you're wondering. Uh, it is not a, it's not an active participle. Okay, so what's that mean? Well, if it's an active part of the that means the subject's doing the acting. Who would be the subject? Me. That would mean my justification is my job perpetually. It's not an active verb. It's a passive verb. Okay, so what's that mean? It means the subject, i.e. me or you, is being acted upon by an outside force. Oh, who's the outside force? God. What's he doing? Making me stay justified. See, how, why, do, why do I believe your salvation is secure until you see Jesus face to face? Because of the verbs. He picked passive, not active. He picked a pre present tense verb about justification. It's his job to keep you justified. Aren't you glad that you're not responsible to keep yourself justified before God? I mean, I am. It, that's his work. So I, it leads to a question, and we're still reviewing, but it leads to a question. 
Are you justified in God's courtroom? You're only justified by one means and one means only. It's called faith in the personal work of Jesus, not your work. Now, on to the sermon. That was a review. Point two of the way out of the cave. Uh, to go back to analogy number one. It's all about the proper payment. It's all about the proper payment. Justification. He says, being justified is a gift by his grace. Now, we'll go to the next part of the clause. Through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Don't you, I know you love participles. Don't you love prepositions? They try to come in church at 8 o'clock and talking to people about grammar. They're like, what are you doing? Anyway, <laughs> I love prepositions because there's many prepositions he could have chose to, to, to talk about this doctrine of justification because it's inspired that he picked this word dia. Uh, you get this justification as he gave it to you as a gift if you want it through. Well, through what? Well, through the redemption, which is in Christ. It's not anybody else. It's only in Christ. But through, uh, through, if you look at a a, a lexical matrix in Greek, which they give you when you take Greek um, eventually, uh, you have two options for that word through in Greek. It can either be the means by which I get this or the manner by which I get this. So it's the means by which I get the justification is through the redemption of Jesus or it's the manner I get justification is the manner through is through the person work of Christ. Either is theologically sound. The point is, do you have the, the justification where you're declared righteous in God's courtroom, to use the second analogy, because of the redemption of Jesus? Have you claimed that to be true for yourself? The word for redemption, very interesting word, apolutrosis in Greek, uh, it has two lexical meanings. Uh, number one, it can denote uh, delivering somebody from a very bad situation, like the boys trapped in the cave. They were, they were redeemed from a very bad situation. That's one definition of the word. The other lexical meaning of the word uh, is uh, to pay a ransom price to deliver somebody. You paid money to deliver somebody. That's the second one. Which nuance is Paul talking about here? I think based upon his emphasis on the death of Christ in this passage, he's talking about the second nuance of the word. He's telling you Jesus paid the price by his life like the divine diver thing, dying for you so you would have the chance of redemption. Uh, here's how that word apolutrosis is used uh, in the New Testament uh, by Paul. Here's another place. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him, and Jesus is the, the him of the pronoun, in him we have redemption through, see, by means or by manner of his blood. That's a figure of speech where the blood represents the death of Christ on the cross. We get redemption through his blood, through none other, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. If you want to be justified in God's courtroom, analogy number two, remember I mixed my mixed metaphors? First metaphor was what? Cave, sinners are lost in a cave. Second metaphor is you're in the courtroom. You're declared guilty by God. How do you find yourself declared righteous? Well, you got to go through the blood of Christ. No other blood. Uh, here's another usage of the word, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Here's how Peter uses the same word, apolutrosis, for redemption. It says that knowing that you were ransomed, same word, uh, from this feudal ways when you were lost, inherited from your forefathers, not with the perishable things such as silver or gold, that didn't save you, that didn't redeem you. Notice the contrast in the word but. What's the contrast? Well, you were saved but by the precious blood of Christ, uh, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. I mean, he's the ultimate sacrifice. He sacrificed himself on the cross so that you could find redemption. He paid the price. He paid the price to to save you and redeem you. I I have to ask you a question. Is he your payment price? Because you have to accept it. Uh, There was a friend of mine in California, uh, well, still is a good friend of mine. Uh, He's worth probably about $300 million. He's about my age. Uh, he came out here to see us uh, some time ago, and he was telling me about a friend of his who uh, was losing his business because the economy was going south where he, he was, and he was losing his business, and he was losing his home, and he's, it was very sad that his friend was losing his home. So I asked this good, uh, very wealthy Christian man, very humble man, I said, well, you know, like, what'd you do? And his business started imploding. He said, well, I, I just bought his home. Excuse me? Yeah, I just paid cash for his house. He didn't need to have a house payment. I'm like, well, uh, I, have a, I have a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that didn't go over well. He just laughed at me like that. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. You have a job, you know. But, it, but the, he made a payment where the guy couldn't pay. That's what Jesus did, right? He made a payment that you could not pay. Imagine the audacity of believing that your works is the payment. It's not the payment. 
Paul says the payment is the work of Jesus. Here's uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Awesome. This is the theme that I have since I got here 10 years ago. Uh, I told the staff when I came, this is, this is what we're about. This is what I'm about. Mark 10, 45. What does it say? For even the Son of Man, code name for the Jesus, uh, came not to be served, he's God, but to do what? Well, to serve. And to do what else? He give his life a ransom for many. So what I've told all the pastors here, staff here, what's our job? We're here as servants to the body of Christ. That's what it's about. And if we exhibit that, that's Christ-likeness. We're here to serve sacrificially. And as we serve and we do it sacrificially, we're teaching the sheep, go do the same thing. Because this is what Jesus did. But he did it, he, he went to the point of the cross for the ransom payment. He paid the cost uh, to redeem mankind from the wrath of the Father against sin. He paid the price. Again, I have to ask the question, is he your redemption price? Because you have to claim him by faith. Third thing, uh, the way out of the cave of sin, or the other analogy was what? Courtroom, Courtroom analogy. Uh, the, to be declared righteous in God's uh, viewpoint. Uh, it's all about proper uh, coverage is number three. It says in verse 25, whom God displayed, speaking of Jesus, publicly as the, there's a word you use all the time, Propitiation. Do you feel propitiated? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I use that word all the time. This is an awesome word. It's a great Old Testament word. It's a great New Testament word. He says, whom God displayed publicly, meaning he sacrificed his son on a hill for all to see. And he did it for what reason? Well, he wanted his son to be a propitiation. Notice, in his blood. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a figure of speech, like a euphemism talking about the death of Christ. Notice the preposition. What's the preposition? Through. How do you get this propitiation, whatever that means? Well, uh, it, like, like redemption, it only comes through faith, and this propitiation only comes through faith. Hey, but I don't, what does propitiation mean? How many people really want to know? I do. Propitiation, like what does it mean? Uh, you have two lexical options, just like you did with redemption. It could denote the expiation, that's just a fancy term for, <laughs> yeah, I got to explain the definition. <laughs> <laughs> It can denote, number one, the expiation of sin or the removal of sin. So Jesus' death removes sin. Or number two, it can connote uh, the coverage of sin so that the Holy Father doesn't see it and judge you accordingly. So it's coverage. The point being is, which nuance is Paul talking about here? Well, I've, uh, I've read my share of commentaries this week. I don't even know how many pages I've read. Scholars debating, because they get paid to debate, as I've told you before. Uh, it's how they write books. They you know, up on their PhD, blah, blah, blah. So they're debating. It's all about expiation. It's the removal of sin. That's what Jesus' work did. Oh, okay. And then over here, they're all arguing. It's, it's all about covering sin so that God's uh, holiness doesn't see it and judge you. It's, okay, it's, it's about that. I came to the conclusion after hours of study, it's both. I mean, it's an enlightening moment. Does, does Christ's death, at your moment of accepting his death by faith to be true for yourself, as you're in that cave of sin, does it expiate you? Yeah. No, does that mean you can turn to your wife right now and go, hey, I am totally sinless? <laughs> uh, I would not suggest saying that. She can probably point out to you a few things from this morning uh, that are probably contrary to your position. Uh, so, but the expiation doesn't mean removal of the sin nature. It's talking about your sinful status. That's why we talked about last week, if you remember 1 Corinthians 1.30, awesome verse, that in Christ, once you are in Christ by faith, you have multiple things. One of them is sanctification. This is positional sanctification. This is positional holiness. He gives you his holiness. Why? You don't have any. He gives it to you. He gives it to you. So he does expiate you in that way. But the other motif I think is more important where he, he says he covers your sin. Covers your sin so that God doesn't see it. He's not angry toward it. It's very interesting because in this book, if you go back to Romans 1, if you want to take your Bible, you have a Bible? A Bible? Turn, turn back to chapter 1. I know it was a few months ago that we were there. Chapter 1, verse 18. Uh, what's this book about? Well, Paul says, uh, I, I want to talk in these opening chapters about the wrath of God. He says, for the wrath of God, in verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What do they do? who suppress the truth of the reality of God's ontological existence, they suppress it in unrighteousness. What's that mean? Oh, they, by definition, come up with all kinds of reasons why they will argue that they are not going to believe in him. Pick the system. They pick it. And he says, that, I'm, I'm going to talk about the fact that God's wrath rests upon on all those who reject God, a relationship with him. That's what he's been talking about. 
He says in chapter one, the Gentiles are guilty of being sinful and suppressing truth. Then in chapters two to three, he says, ah, the the Jews are guilty too because they try to get into God's presence based on works. He says uh, we're all guilty from being under the wrath of God. So I think the second nuance of the term is most appropriate where God's covering your sin at the moment of faith to where the Father doesn't see it. I don't know, when, when you stand before God and say St. Peter's really at the gate, <laughs> I'm just saying, and he looks at you and he says, why should you come into this place? Boy, big time for you to start talking, right? I mean, if that actually happens. I mean, what's gonna work there on that day? He, Jesus, just point to Jesus. He's got me covered. I'm not joking, he's got me covered. What's covered? Blood of Christ covers me. When did that happen? Well, for me, it was September 5th, 1967. Remember the day. Blood was applied. Remember that song, Oh, Happy Day? Oh, Happy Day. I'm not a singer, but Oh, Happy Day. Yeah, Darren's not here, but you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Happy Day. Why? Covered. Covered. So he's telling you, once you're covered by the blood of Christ at the moment of faith, when the Father looks down upon you, he, he doesn't see that sin anymore. He sees, well, you're covered. My wrath doesn't come against you anymore. You know, that just leads to a logical question. Number one, I just asked you, do you have faith? Number two, I just asked you, are you is Jesus your redeemer? He paid the price for you. And then this next logical question is, you covered? Is your sin covered? It's either covered or uncovered. The only way to get it covered is faith in the work of Christ. Now, he says very interesting I find this fascinating. Notice he says in verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation to cover our sins through faith. You see that? How many words is that? It's a deep question. You see, how many words do you see? Two, thank you. There's two. In the Greek text, there's three. But it didn't translate over with the third word. So the third word in the Greek text is placed between through and faith. Uh, And I actually had a guy in the second service, I think he was a doctor, actually checked this to see. And he told me after the service, yeah, there really is another word there. Like I would be kidding about something like that. (laughs) This is a really interesting church. Yeah, there's another word there. What's the word? It's the word the. Hmm. Add that to the translation. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation to remove his anger uh, in his blood through the faith. What's that mean? Well, you have two options, grammatically speaking. It can be the monadic use of the article, monad, monadic, another word you use all the time, monadic use of the article, meaning it's the one and only, meaning there's no other one. It's, that's it. So that means the faith is the Christian faith, i.e. the gospel of Jesus. He came, died, and rose again. That's the faith. There's no other faith, which means if you don't come to God by means of that faith, you don't come to God. So monadic use of the article. Second option, par excellence use of the article, meaning, oh, el supremo, (laughs) nothing better. It's the best. There's nothing higher. And so Paul says, if you try to come through any other means, you don't come. You got to come through faith. The faith, not a faith. And then he adds these words in verse 25. This This is interesting. He says, this, all of this, this was done to demonstrate his righteousness, God's righteousness, because in the forbearance, this is a complex sentence. Uh, and Paul does this a lot, where he throws a whole lot of commas together. Uh, this was all done to demonstrate his righteousness, God's righteousness, because in the forbearance or patience of God, he, God, passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Huh? You ever read those passages and you walk away going, what did he just say? Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, be honest. I mean, when you read it and you're thinking, what? I don't get that. Like, what did he just say? Who do, you, who do you talk to? Or do you just skip over it? Maybe sometime in my lifetime I'll figure it out. Um, I like the Bible and walking with God because you have the Holy Spirit as your personal aid. I'm serious. So I, I'm going to ask him, Lord, I don't quite get that. I mean, exactly, you know, let's, let me, help me to analyze that. And, and the spirit always shows up. What Paul's getting at here is really interesting. He, he's telling you, God is, he, he's, he's the ultimate judge. He's very wise. So he doesn't want to be confu- uh, conf- uh, he doesn't want to be accused of being uh, unmerciful. And he doesn't want to be accused of being uh, a man, a judge without justice. 
Because think of it this way. He's, he's telling you, God took his time to put his son on that cross. That's what he's telling you. In the forbearance of God, with the patience of God. He didn't nuke us because of our sin from the very beginning. He could have. Imagine, Adam and Eve sin. God comes down and says, you've sinned. Poof. It's over. He's holy. He could have done that. He didn't do that, did he? Because he had a plan out of his love for us to redeem us, all right? So the, under the forbearance of God, he waited, 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 you know, waited until 5 BC when his son was born and then, then his son goes to the cross. He waited. Why was he waiting? Well, if he acted too quickly, I mean, nuking mankind right from the garden, man could have stood before his throne and said, you are not a merciful God. See? He waited. Why? Because, well, if he waited too long, then we could have complained on judgment day as he judged us. Uh, well, I don't have a problem with you being merciful because you waited thousands of years, but uh, you, you, you weren't just because you waited too long. No, no. At the right time, the Messiah died. God's perfect timing to show that God is the only one who can justify a sinner. That's why he's the ultimate judge. That's the third way. Again, I have to ask you, are you covered by the, the blood of Christ? How do you get covered? Faith of a child to say, God, cover me. Lastly, the way out of that cave is all about the proper focus. If Paul, like a Socratic scholar, rabbinical scholar, scholar is going to ask a bunch of questions. Who's he speaking to? Contextually, Jews. What is their presupposition? We're saved because we're Jews. <laughs> Uh, and because we love the Torah, and I got a Torah scroll in my house, and we're very respectful, we kiss this, I got a mezuzah on the door, I mean, we kiss that when we walk in, we say the Shema, I mean, we are, we are devout. And Paul says, uh, I have a question. Uh, where then is boasting? I mean, if, you, if you're coming to God by means of works, where's boasting? What does he say? Uh, it's excluded. It's, there's nothing to boast about. If salvation is by faith, not by works, there's nothing to boast about. Uh, he says, by what kind of law? I mean, uh, of works? No. He says, it, it is uh, excluded by the law of faith. Faith tells you, once you come to God by means of faith, there is no boasting. There's, because what can you only boast in? The work of Christ. I don't know about you. I got nothing to boast in. Why? Because, well, my boast is in the work of Christ. That's what he says. He says in verse 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. You might need to read that again. For we maintain that a man is justified in God's courtroom, how? By faith, not by works, apart from the works of the law. You know how many religions in our world have not got that memo? Do you realize? How many well-meaning, nice people all are under the assumption that they will get into God's presence by all their things they're doing perpetually, their works, I mean, our world is full of them. Jesus said in, uh, when, in, when you go back to Matthew uh, 12 and then chapter 13, where he starts giving the parable of the sower and the soils, and he talks about, you know, he'll, in, before he comes back, you can throw the gospel seed into the world, uh, and uh, weeds are going to come up. And they're going to look a lot like the gospel, and they're going to deceive people. I don't know how you feel about four o'clock flowers. I love them. Do you like them? Do you even know what they are? Really? No idea. They're absolutely gorgeous. Trumpet flowers, very vibrant. Uh, vibrant. Uh, they, re they resist the heat. Uh, you hardly have to water them. Awesome plant. And they come back every year. Think of the money saved to send the kids to school. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> but I, I, I plant them in my yard uh, every year because one of my uncles, uh, my Uncle Walter, uh, who was a... Uh, uh, fought in France in, in uh, World War II. Very great army man. Uh, before he died, uh, he was a farmer and he loved to grow things like I do. And so he, he gave me four o'clock seed. I've kept those seeds growing in my yard. I don't know, Liz, what, 20 years? I've transferred those seeds around from my Uncle Walter. Uh, but only in this state does another plant come up with my four o'clock seed that looks identical to it. Only in Virginia. Didn't happen in California. This, it comes up, it looks identical to it, but it doesn't have the trumpet flowers. So if you ever see me out by my mailbox, down in the gutter, with my beautiful trumpet flowers of my four o'clock, pulling out things, I'm pulling out that weed that looks identical to the four o'clock. And every time I do it, it's like a theological exercise when I'm gardening. Does this happen to you when you're gardening? Because Jesus said, there's gonna be weeds gonna come up and they're gonna look like it's all about a way to get to God, but it's a phony way, it's a fake way. Because it's all about your activity with a little bit of faith over here. No, Paul says you're justified by faith in the person and work of Christ apart from the works of the law. 
He says over in uh, verse 29, says says another question to his Jewish brethren he's writing to in Rome. Is God the God of the Jews only? Uh, is he not the God of the Gentiles also? He says, yes, my conclusion is he's, he's God of the Gentiles also. This is very interesting. He quotes here from uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema. Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He says, have you guys considered the Shema? And they're like, what is he talking about now? The whole, he says, well, think about it. Our, our Lord is one Lord. He says, if God is one Lord, ipso facto, he'd be the God of the Gentiles. That's what he's saying. Have you guys considered this? And then he's telling them, if God is the God of the uh, Jews and the Gentiles, and he said you're saved by faith in the work of the Messiah, not your own work, then there can't be another way. Because there's only how many gods? One God. So there can't be one God for the Jew and the Gentiles have a whole bunch of gods and there's multiple ways up the path to God. There's only one way because there's only one God. Remember we talked about this, a law of non-contradiction, first principles of logic. Do you remember like what it means? You can't have two opposing viewpoints true at the same time in the same sense but they're diametrically opposed. You cannot. It's the first principle of Aristotelian logic. So I, if you believe in no gravity and I believe in gravity, one of us is going to win when I invite you to come up to the top of the church. <laughs> I, <laughs> I invite you, go first. Illustrate the principle there is no gravity. Because you can't have those diametrically opposed positions to be same, same, true at the same time, according to Aristotle. He's right. I'll, I'll do the hospital visitation as you step off. Okay. So what's Paul say? There's only one God. He's the God of the Jew and the Gentile by definition, which means there's only one way to him, not multiple ways. That's the problem I have with that bumper sticker. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because it's based on the premise of there's multiple ways. There's not multiple ways. Paul says there's only one way. Only one way. Don't be deceived. He says in verse 30, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith, the Jew, and the uncircumcised through faith is one. There's only one. One. There's no other way. Verse 31, he didn't ask a final question. He says, uh, then do we as Christian Jews nullify the law through faith? Because that's, Sinners are clever. When they don't want to come to God, they'll throw an accusation at you to kind of knock you off your, your argument. So here's the argument they're telling Paul. Oh, I get it, Paul. You're so much onto justification by faith, you just trashed the Torah. That's terrible. He, he said, no I, no, I didn't. Notice what he says as he closes his argument. He says what? In relationship to the question. The next verse, the last verse, he says, may it never be. This is the strongest way to say no in Greek. Uh, if you were a, a child and your mother said to you, me gonoito, it's over for you. This is like the ultimate no way. He says, no way, may it never be. On the contrary, we as Christian Jews establish the law. We're not anti-Torah. He says, step away from the Torah and understand the Torah does a couple of things. Number one, primarily, it shows you what is sin. We're for that because it shows us that we're sinners and it points to the Savior. Um, I made the mistake Friday night about 5.30. I was on I, I, Interstate 66 heading west. <laughs> you think anybody was with me? The entire town was with me. And, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm in, you know, I don't know what lane I was in, but I'm looking over there and I'm seeing those uh, diamond things painted over there thinking, oh, cool, HOV. So I told Nathan, who's with me, I wonder if we're qualified to get over there. I, I don't know, you know. And so I kept looking for a sign, not from God, but, a sign, you know, and so pretty soon after several miles of going five miles an hour, finally a sign, HOV, two or more, praise God, we pulled over there, and then I had another question for Nathan, you remember the next question, Nathan, how fast can I go over here, I'm a Virginian, how fast can I go, and I, I don't know, and I, I, I wait, and I wait, and I wait, I'm going 55 miles an hour in the fast lane, because I don't want to break the law, what's the law do, it tells me what is sin, I'm not breaking the law, so after a couple of miles of really getting some people from D.C. upset at me, uh, I saw a sign, and the sign said 65. Praise God, I ramped it up 10 more miles an hour. Remember, Nathan? It was amazing. Uh, what's the law do? Does the law fix me when I go 85? Nope. It just tells me that's sin. Paul says, I established the law by my life. It shows me what is sin and that I need a Savior. I don't, I, I'm not anti-law. I'm pro-law because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. I close with two pictures. This is a cool picture. Who are those guys? Those are the kids that were delivered from the cave. I uh, wonder why they're smiling. Wouldn't you be? I mean, you know they had to give some of these kids drugs to settle them down so they didn't hyperventilate as they went down into the water? 
I mean, think about it. I mean, here's another picture. It's amazing. What's that? Oxygen tanks for all of them. There's 13 of them. They had to swim them in like one at a time to fit them down through that little tiny opening. And then those kids had to look at those divers and do what with the tank? See, look at the size of the tank. It's the size of a child. Then they had to put it on. Then they had to step into the dark water and knowing what they were going to go swimming through in the darkness and trust that that, say, that, that diver is going to take them to life. And they all had faith, did they not? In the evidence at hand, and they were all redeemed because one guy laid his life down. That's what Jesus has done, right? But you're not putting on a tank. You're kneeling at a cross, and you're saying, God, I'm a sinner, and I need you. The day you do that, you become justified in his courtroom, redeemed, he paid the price. What's the next term? Propitiated, he covers you. He covers you. There's nothing better. This is the day uh, that I'm challenging you to, to do that, make that most certain. Uh, we have counselors who'd love to pray and introduce you to Christ. Or, or even me, catch me. I'd love to pray with you. And if you're a believer, this is what you should be sharing with all those about you who erroneously think they're gonna work their way into God's presence because they need Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for today to open the words of life, to delve into the intricacies of the gospel. Uh, and we pray you would do what you need to do with what we've said to bring glory to yourself. In Christ's name, amen.